So this, I hope, is the last uh, recording chunk for this lecture set, the Binet Scales. Last time, uh, we discussed the fourth revision, the one that's in the book. Uh, the fifth edition is where we're going next, uh, unless something has drastically changed in my slides since I recorded yesterday. So let's just keep going. The um, fifth edition has a, has a similar hierarchical structure, or at least it tries to. But before I, I go too much deeper, there was a change in the classification labeling for the uh, fourth to the fifth edition in terms of like IQ classification. Um, and I, I found interesting, uh, and I figured I would share it with you starting from, I'm gonna go from most to least gifted. So for scores, uh, 45 to 60. So that's three to four standard deviations above the mean. That one is labeled as a very gifted or highly advanced. Next is two, stand, two to three standard deviations. So that's 130 to 144. And that's labeled as gifted or very advanced. Now IQs ranging from 120 to 129 are labeled here as superior 100 to 119. Higher, high average, anywhere between 90 and 109, it's labeled as average. So think about that as like typical. Um, 80 to 89 is low average. Um, below that, so 70 to 79 is the labeling I have here written is borderline impaired or delayed. 55 to 69 is mildly impaired or delayed. 40 to 54 is moderately impaired to delayed. And that's that's the lowest I have here. Um, but like these labels, as you notice here, they're not uh, how the original version, which classified people as like idiot, imbecile, and um, moron. As technical terms, you'll notice here that they're framing it as like below average, impaired or delayed and they're using that so like borderline mildly and moderate so instead of having like a noun it's kind of describing it to a degree rather than like as a classification and i i personally like that method better uh because it's descriptive and not diagnostic and it feels less judgment based i guess um but let's keep kind of plowing ahead uh, let's talk about the hierarchical structure and it's broken up into both like verbal and nonverbal but as you can see here in this slide like there's a note that octopus to me it looks like an octopus i don't know why like on its side but so you've got general intelligence and that's kind of overarching uh fluid reasoning which has a verbal and nonverbal section general knowledge uh which verbal and nonverbal you see a theme here We've got quantitative reasoning, visual spatial reasoning, and um, working memory. And so scoring the Stanford Binet 5 uh, takes into account this, um, this structure. Now it breaks down it, so it's got the general full scale IQ as G, and then it's broken up into two chunks. So it's got the nonverbal and verbal components. And within those chunks, then it breaks it down, uh, the nonverbal for like um, fluid reasoning, knowledge, quantitative, visuospatial, working memory. So it's got verbal versions and nonverbal versions of both. And so um, it's a different way to kind of nest the date, like to think about the nesting of the data in compared to the last slide where it was G and then there was a non -ver there was um, then we did like reasoning knowledge each of those essentially flipping the layers here so the boxes would be above um, but this this structure is kind of cleaner and first of all it's easier to model but that's beside the point so that's the idea here uh, with scoring now um, there are subtests and these are used for adaptive testing. And so they add kind of like nonverbal, they added a nonverbal like kind of routing to like kind of gauge 
where people are in addition to the basic vocab test. Like those are kind of the anchors on where test administrators start. And so the nonverbal one is the matrices in addition to a vocab test. And the idea here is to add, have both, given the, the new structure has that nonverbal and verbal distinction, they didn't want to overly weight the verbal aspect. So that's why adding the matrices subtest is um, a, a solid move. So there are 10 subtests. Um, it contains many of the same subtests from, so the, on the SF4, on the uh, Binet 4, there were 15. Um, it's, it's around 10 here. And I'm desperately in need of my breakfast. <laughs> um, but a lot of the subtests from the fourth edition have been altered or combined. Now it represents all the abilities tested by the formal, the f earlier versions, but um, kind of smushes them together a bit to not overly reward the verbal aspects of uh, the score. So the, but, but in theory, because it has all the older skill sets put in, you can, the idea is to allow them to be comparable across. So if you have an older score, um, it, it can be kind of converted. Um, so yeah, now the fifth intro, the fifth edition reintroduces that age scale format back into the test. So it, uh, that older editions have, um, the, the idea is that, uh, you're presenting like a variety of items at each level of the test. Uh, so it's intended to keep like, per, like the content is like the reason why they do a lot of variety is it keeps examinees inv involved and interested. And it allows for, um, the introduction of like developmentally, uh, distinct items across levels. It also retains the old point system, which is nice. Now the 10, ten subtests. So the short-term memory subtest has been shifted over to the working memory piece. Almost all the other subscales are the same other than like the addition of like the visual spatial reasoning component as well as just like a few name changes so here's the old version on the left um so you you go from abstract slash visual reasoning to fluid reasoning you go from verbal reasoning to knowledge quantitative reasoning to quantitative reasoning go from short-term memory to working memory so the big addition here is visual and spatial because that is an important aspe aspect of intelligence that's not typically assessed. As you may recall from your time taking the SAT or the um, ACT, those tests, again, they, they, keep, they change them a little over time. Um, but I've taken many different administrations of it and I believe that either way, uh, every variant of the SAT I, that I am familiar with uh, doesn't really tap visual spatial reasoning. So that's your ability to kind of like represent ideas in space versus there's definitely kind of a verbal section and a quantitative section. And often there's a writing section, depending on what year. The SAT really doesn't know what it wants to do with that section, but it misses that spatial reasoning aspect. Other tests don't miss that aspect as much, including the Stanford Binet, but also the uh, ASVAB, so the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, which um, I'm looking to see if, nope, I do not have that test either. Um, when when I was uh, essentially removing, when I was triaging books from my office, unfortunately, the like standardized test ones are a little heavy. Oh, wait. Oh wait, I um just wait one second. Let's see, I think I can pause. Okay, so um I do have one prop, apparently. So this is the uh study guide for the um armed services vocational aptitude battery test. Um it is old, 
because it's from 2002 because one of the papers I or one of the data sets I work on uses a, a very specific version. Um, and so this is the 18th edition. There are newer ones, but it um, includes. Uh, let's see if I can. Um, come up, grab a. So it, it's got study guides here. I'm really trying to see if I can pull up a picture. Um, it it has. Oof. Okay. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but it has kind of like it's it's got a spatial reasoning kind of diagram piece here. Um, unfortunately, I do not have a scanner, but um, it it has a whole like auto and it 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 gives some more aspects to this 3D spatial reasoning piece. And I think that's primarily because uh, like one, it has a section on like car mechanics um, and like, which I, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to articulate this, but some tests have the spatial reasoning component and it's typically, in tests where it's a really essential piece of the job, um, including the uh, the there's a there's a dental it's like the MCAT but for dentists that includes a 3D like rendering piece, um, but it's less common. It's becoming more common. Spatial reasoning is like an important aspect that is not covered as strongly, and so. And so part of that piece is included here before I keep distracting myself. But yeah, so there's that fifth aspect and just each one of those aspects has a verbal and nonverbal part within these subtests. So for fluid reasoning, you've got matrix tasks for the nonverbal. Um, maybe it'd be helpful if I just go through all the nonverbal first. Um, so for nonverbal, you've got matrix tasks. Uh, for fluid reasoning, for the knowledge piece, you have recognizing absurdities in pictures. For quantitative reasoning, uh, it's math stuff. It's just the quantitative. It might be easier to com compare that one with um, the verbal quantitative reasoning, which is more word problems. And uh, but each of them, the the idea is that there's one aspect that doesn't lean heavily on verbal ability and another aspect that does for each of these subtasks. So these are what form boards look like, where you essentially like have to put the pieces in the box, in the correct space. I encourage you to kind of check these out online, um, but as you can see here, they don't have, there isn't really a verbal component. It's like demonstrating knowledge instead. the sf i don't know what sorry I'm, I'm working on a scale right now that uses the san francisco health measure so i keep saying sf instead of sb so the stanford binet did change a standard deviation to 15 instead of 16. so on the old tests a uh, an iq of 132 is now an iq of 130. it still represents the same two standard deviations but um but it, it still kind of covers, like, so, so you just have to be mindful of what the standard deviation is to get a better sense of those IQ differences. So now it's also much more game oriented than it used to be by, and when I say game oriented, it's to have, because uh, this is primarily, like this is more targeted at children, so every no each of those game oriented pieces like that nonverbal behavior for the most part. Now this also taps into the extremes of intelligence at all ages. So uh, the, the idea is to move it beyond just like the cap at 16 that uh, Terman had originally. 
Now it's it was standardized with stratified sampling using 4,800 respondents. That is a pretty solid amount. I've seen studies with more, but um, it's it's a solid. It's it's way better than like the original, which you may recall had 50 respondents as their like standardized sample. But the basic idea is that there are changes that have gone on. And um, and that's, you know, kind of adapting tests based on current knowledge and trying to recognize that some tests aren't equally balanced and doing their best to kind of balance them so that they're not like over rewarding certain abilities. Now, like the the full scale IQ reliability is fantastic. I that's one reason why I had to like just share it. It's it ranges from like ninety set or point nine seven to point nine eight. It's awesome. I I I'm sorry. I I realize that I'm kind of yelling at you, but mo. This is why I love working with IQ data because it's really reliable, and um the reliabilities are great across ages, and uh the reliabilities for both the like nonverbal and verbal are really high uh, like the full scale is 0.98 um, the like nonverbal is 0.95 the verbal is 0.96 and each of those like five factors those five like sub like subdomains range from like 0.9 to 0.92 and it's awesome now even when you get into test retest like those can range a bit from 0.7s, typically more in the 0.9s. Uh, the longer time between test retests, the lower it is, but it's still really high. Like, it's it's awesome. And honestly, a lot of the in unreliable, like that reduction in test retest, is either because of like age developmental reasons, or maybe examiner differences, which I know is part of the test, but these are great. And so the manual, which uh, is not in my home, um, provides a lot of support for both the validity of these as well as the reliability. And so like this test, it's it predicts really well, um, which definitely, so with that high reliability, if it has the ability, like if it's related to the construct, it's gonna tap that construct or it's going to tap whatever it predicts. You really enjoy, like, it's, this is why I work with IQ data, because it has a lot of nice psychometric properties.